And now, my dear friends, I have a very great honor, and I mean that most sincerely, to not introduce to you our guest, our featured speaker. He is well known to all of you, but rather merely to give him an opportunity to approach the, the rostrum after having been identified for the very few who may not recognize the chief shepherd of all the souls of the church in Philadelphia, His Eminence, John Cardinal Kroll. Thank you, Father Keel. It's a real pleasure to share this uh, 30th Memorial Communion Mass and Breakfast with you. I was sure that I was being invited to the Communion Mass and Breakfast. I am not so sure now whether it was for that that I was invited or to commemorate a Silver Jubilee. But however it is, I still am grateful for the invitation and I enjoy my, for the pleasure of being with you. I was very comfortable when Mr. Dickendorfer was talking and I would hope that he run, would run the time out, caboose or no caboose, so that we would hit the station and I could uh, continue listening to him. And I want to say this very sincerely, Mr. Dittendorfer, that I am grateful to you for the wisdom of your words for reflecting the, the teachings of the scriptures and for giving witness to the fact that there is no point or time in our life when we can divorce ourselves or be isolated from or separated from God, that all of this teaching must penetrate and permeate every moment, every day of our lives. And for this, I am very grateful to you, and I say this very sincerely. At the rectory before coming over, Monsignor Howard, the rector of the cathedral, says, are you talking at the breakfast? I says, yes. He says, gee, you must give a lot of talks. I says, how much is a lot? I says, what would you think for the month of October? He says, like two a week. I says, would you uh, believe it was better than one a day? 32 times. And I says, that wasn't exactly exceptional because in the first 12 days of November, it'll be, if I survive, 10 times. To tell you the truth, I don't know that much to be talking that often. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it goes contrary to a very basic advice of my father. He says, if you talk, you hear only what you know. But if you keep your big mouth shut, you might learn something and hear something different that you don't know. So I must say that at this point, my the revered memory of my father, I, I think that he is terribly disappointed with me that I not following his suggestions. I have no intention of preaching to you. I'm grateful to you that you do, in this fashion, profess your faith in God and in Jesus Christ. This is a work of religion. This is an act of merit. And for that I am deeply grateful to you, to know, to know Mr. Father Keel, that you give this type of an example. I would perhaps, <clears throat> rather than try to present a formal talk at a perhaps almost a torrential level, throw a few ideas at you, perhaps weave a multicolored fabric which would present the background, the drop, or an event that will take 
place in Philadelphia next August 1 to 8, to the Eucharistic Congress. And I would like, I'd like to weave this pat fabric by approaching it, and I suppose this is not intended as a pun, on a double track of both civil and ecclesial, community and individual considerations in reference to the Eucharistic Congress. Somebody asked me how, what are the dimensions of it? I don't know. As of now, we have over a thousand people involved in committee work and preparation. And you can't imagine all of the various types of activities that are involved. They tell me that in the greater area, they've got 18,000 hotel rooms that as of now are reserved. We're looking for 20,000 homes take care of some of the visitors, especially those from countries where the third world nations. These are not strangers, these are families of our, these are members of our household of faith who share with us the life of Christ and the Holy Communion. All I know is that we've tried to explore the possibility of having the Amtrak <coughs> run a little more equipment and uh, they tell us that that doesn't look too promising, but the fact is that along the track from Boston down to Washington, Arlington, there are some 15 to 7 million Catholics. We don't say they're all coming, but uh, we hope a lot of them will. Uh, somehow or another, people are focusing on this. Some of you are familiar with the uh, fabulous individual, Mother Teresa, wrote a very humble letter to me. She says, you know I don't know how to talk, but I will come. And uh, I don't think I should talk, but I will do whatever you ask. So I wrote back, Mother Teresa, you're going to come and you're going to talk. I've heard him talk, and on the Eucharist. Cardinal Sumans, I talked this past week with the Secretary of the Bishop's Conference of Poland. They would like to have one Cardinal about a dozen bishops come in for the event. So how many people will there be? If the Holy Father comes and he's uh, well disposed to come in, depending on health and uh, the situation in the world and the church, how many people do you suppose there might be in Philadelphia? Very frankly, I hope we're going to have one of the biggest traffic jams in the world. And I'm inclined to think we're going to have it. As much work as is being put in by extremely capable, uh, competent people in preparation for this Congress, I would say that if we bat 600, I'll be happy. Because there's no way that you can cover all contingencies for an event when you are not fully aware of the attendance. Suffice it to say that for well, that particular week, we have at our disposal the two stadia, the spectrum, the convention hall, the exhibit hall, the academy of music, both Dells, and uh, we intend to uh, move, if we can, move the University of Pennsylvania to take in the palestra and a few other facilities that they have. But we happen to choose that week because there was no other scheduled activity sport event or anything else. That's a little bit of the picture of what we're moving to. The question is why? The bicentennial is being observed and it's generally described in terms of a declaration of independence. I would rather see it reflected, especially during this bicentennial year, in a proper focus. In my judgment, it was a declaration of dependence far more than it was of independence. Independence is mentioned three times. Dependence upon God is mentioned four times. And that declaration underlined the fact that the spiritual is supreme in life. 
that man's rights, his dignity, derived from God and government must protect those rights. They do not come from the state, not from any new case or pleasure of any ruling body. This is the fundamental principle of our political philosophy. And I know that there have been many statements made by many men in the highest offices. I don't know if anybody expressed it more clearly than George Washington in his farewell address. Religion and morality are the indispensable supports of government. And both reason and experience tell us that national morale cannot be preserved to the exclusion of religious education. These are fundamental principles of the political philosophy of the Republic of the United States. What has been happening? We look at particular problems today, get a little disturbed and a little excited, and we look for a kind of a patchwork solutions. Let us take an overall picture. The growing crime rate. We hear so much about it. It is a fact. In the past 15 years, the total number of crimes has increased at rather has tripled, tripled in the past 15 years. Three times as many today as there were 15 years ago. We read about the homicides in uh, Northern Ireland shot. And yet, take a uh, city that has a uh, population just about the same as Northern Ireland, Detroit. The homicide rate in Detroit is four times greater than that of Northern Ireland. The homicide rate of the ten largest cities in the United States is greater than the homicide rate in Northern Ireland. Criminal homicide of youngsters, of people under 18. In that period, the arrest jumped 255% male arrests, 308% female arrests. There are many other disturbing signs, and perhaps the, one of them is that the young people, at least a million young Americans, most of them middle class, run away from home each year. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for young Americans between 15 and 24, the second leading cause. Approximately 10% of all school-aged children have moderate to severe mental and emotional troubles. Drug abuse, alcoholism among teenagers are a serious public health problem. Venereal diseases have jumped up to epidemic proportions. What's the why of this? And what's the solution? The why of it in my judgment, is that we are losing the spiritual and religious capital which has carried us all these 200 years. Why are we losing it? We are losing it because, in my judgment, the Supreme Court, which is committed to preserve this country, has followed an absolutist theory of church and state separation, and I am for separation of church and state, but not for that absolutist concept of it, that it has in successive, successive decisions taken up the cause for a religion that can be described as 
humanist secularism. It has prevented the recitation of a simple prayer in the public schools. The prayer which said no more, God, bless the president, bless my country, my parents and my teachers. That is forbidden. It seems that in our schools we have to have not freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. Aid to non-public schools. And mind you, the parents who use that option pay educational taxes as well as any other parents. All they ask are the same secular subjects that are taught in non-public school, non schools and in the uh, public schools that those expenses be covered, even as they are in England where they have a united church and state where the prevailing Religion is Episcopalianism, Anglicanism, but even there, 85% of the capital costs are paid by the government, 100% operational. They have no problem. No problem anywhere in the world. In Rhodesia, they have no problem. It's 75 and 100%. But here, this has been taken and carried to such an extreme that we have a generation of young people growing up without any concept of God, of accountability to God, of responsibility to the commandments, or of their obligations. We talk about delinquency. Delinquency is departure from a known path, let us say, a virtue. This isn't delinquency. This is sheer ignorance promoted by a philosophy which was never intended, never expressed by the founding fathers and not in any of our constitutional documents. And this, in fact, is contrary to it. Now, this is beginning to reflect itself in so many different ways. We heard earlier the talk about sin. Sin today has become very unpopular. The jurists have converted sin into crime. And therefore, if it's legal, it's proper. If it's illegal, a crime. The possibility that a man can do wrong without committing a crime is almost obscured. And then along came the psychologist and psychiatrist and says, well, really, it's not a crime. This is a symptom. It's an illness. It's the result of environment, of education, of upbringing, and so on. And as a result, they make of a human being a total nitwit who does not have a free will, who cannot, if he feels like it, say, no, I will not have apple pie and ice cream. I don't want it. It isn't good for me. Everybody is a victim of the circumstances. <clears throat> and if that is true, then nobody can be guilty. Nobody commits a sin. And that is why you have people today who are sometimes apprehended in the flagrant act of violence, of crime, saying, I have done nothing wrong. People in high offices who have, by conclusive evidence, been guilty of fraud, of bribery, of whatever you want. I have done nothing wrong. Now, I respect the obligation of the Fifth amend, uh, Amendment, and I would defend it very much. Pleading not guilty is a privilege and a, that we have and a right that we have. But to say I have done nothing wrong publicly, that's another matter. But this is a type of a situation that we have in our civil society that looks for some kind of a solution. That's the one track. Let's take the other track of the church. We've had a Vatican Council. The Vatican Council called for renewal. Restore all things to Christ, as Pius X put it at the beginning of the century. And this is a council for renewal. People have become fascinated with it. And they began to <clears throat> so-called implement not the words of the council, but what they thought was the spirit of the council. 
And as a result, there's been turbulence, there's been confusion. But let's really examine the 16 documents of the Council. What kind of renewal is there called for? Every one of those documents, whether it's addressing itself to bishops, to religious, to priests, or to the laity, every one of those documents has a very strong reference to renewal in the Eucharist. That this is the source of all our power, this is the goal of all of our efforts. So that if there's going to be any type of a renewal, it is related to the Eucharist. And that is why, my dear friends, not because I'm a brave man or courageous, but because when I was approached about a Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia in 76, and mind you, approaches had been made in 64, 68, and 72 to the Bishop's Conference, there were no volunteers, and I was among those who did not volunteer. But when I said specifically Philadelphia, now I would have to say no, and I didn't have the courage. I didn't dare to close the door to the possible and necessary renewal in and through the Eucharist. And so, if you want to call it a headache, I look at it as a pleasant one, a troublesome one, but I look forward at least in one segment of our society look forward to a Eucharistic renewal. We have a program which is nationwide, renewal beginning on the first Sunday of Advent. All we're asking, and we're asking everyone, to relate their life to Christ, to realize that we have Christ present with us, to realize that all of our objectives in life is to unity with, in Christ and with Christ both in time and in eternity. And it's for that reason that we look to this Eucharistic Congress not as a great demonstration, not as a romantical type of a uh, performance or a drama, but really with the hope, the prayer, and the conviction that through this Eucharistic Congress, we Catholics will be renewed. And I might say that there is an ecumenical dimension to this, which is very hard but we at least will be renewed, and we, through that type of renewal, by our witness to Christ, the witness of our lives, by our example, should become the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We should become the leaven that will transform, hopefully to some degree, the society in which we live, this country which God has blessed so abundantly. This my dear friends, is the hope, the object of our efforts with reference to the Eucharistic Congress. I thank you very kindly.